golf. Great view. It's almost nice enough to golf. Probably there are golfers out there. So, um, welcome to our first First Friday Forum of 2012. And I'm Dave Gass. I'm the chair of the Business Advocacy Committee, which organizes these First Friday Forums. So, we've got a very good program to start, to start out our year. And I will introduce the panelists real shortly, but I do have some announcements to make. At your table, there should be uh, two sheets, one entitled uh, Focal Point 2012, and one that's entitled uh, Sheboygan County Chamber January Event Calendar. Uh, I'm not gonna go over all those items, but I would just draw your attention to those items uh, as to upcoming um, programs and events sponsored by the Chamber. There's some, there are a number of very good events on there, and we encourage you to participate in as many of them as you are able to. A couple of other announcements on uh, January, the January 5th through 12th, uh, Congressman Petri is going to be holding a series of town meetings uh, throughout uh, 12 locations in the 6th district. So um, in Sheboygan, the location is at the Mead Public Library from 2 to 3 on January 9th. Uh, the other locations are in Watertown, Waupon, and Berlin, and Manasha. So if you're interested in those locations, see the actual group. Um, and the other announcement I'd like to make is uh, the, the work that's going to be done in I-43 this summer. Uh, I know last year that caught a lot of people by surprise, especially the merchants. And the DOT is trying to do a better job of, not or of communicating that. And they are going to have a public meeting uh, for the work that's going to be done on I-43 in Sheboygan County on Wednesday, January 11th at 5 p.m. at the Quarry View Center, which is on uh, Business 42 um, Calumet Drive on the north side of town. So if any of you are interested in what the work is going to be and how it's going to affect you, um, go to that public hearing on January 11th at Quarry View Center. Then for our First Friday Forums, uh, as you all know, today's First Friday Forum is a spotlight on health care um, in Chihuahua County with specific reaction as to uh, how local uh, providers, um, employers are going to be dealing or trying to deal with the federal health care legislation. Coming up in February, we, were, we had hoped to have someone from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce speak. We weren't able to get them here in February on our first Friday forum date. It looks like we're going to do that in May. So in, in February, we're going to have Todd Berry come from the uh, Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance and um, if you've ever been to his performance or his presentations in the past, <laughs> Uh, some probably would characterize that. Uh, it's always very informative, and he, and, and he really is fairly straightforward in, in telling you the way he sees it in behalf of the Wisconsin Taxpayer Alliance. And I'm sure he's going to have a lot of interesting comments on what's happening in Madison from their viewpoint representing taxpayers. So uh, that'll be a good, a good presentation. Then in April, or excuse me, March, we will have our legislators do their um, quarterly legislative update. And again, I think they're probably going to have a couple of things to say at that time. We'll be in the thick of all this election business. So um, that, I'm sure, will be a very exciting presentation. Then in May, excuse me, uh, April, we're going to have a spotlight on economic development in uh, Sheboygan County. And we haven't put all of the uh, cast together yet, but that's the topic. And so we'll give you more details at the February First Friday Forum. And then in May, our intent is to have, again, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce come here and talk about really what is happening on a national scene from the Chamber of Commerce's, Commerce's perspective. And then in June, we have the legislators back for their quarterly. And that takes us through six months of the year, which is as far as we've gotten so far. Um, I believe that's it. Anybody have any other announcements that we've missed, John? Okay. Again, before I uh, introduce our panelists, uh, all of you have a postcard at your table. If you have a topic that you, or a question that you 
like to see whether the panelists might be able to answer dealing with, you know, how as an employer you're dealing with health care, can deal with health care changes. Um, write your question on that postcard, and then John is going to pick up those postcards, and then he's going to bring them back to our table, and we'll look through them and see whether we can get any of them up to, to our uh, questioner for the question and answer session. With that, um, let's get the program rolling. Um, again, our program today is really um, on sort of health care uh, locally, how our local providers and employers dealing with the many health care changes that are taking place, most particularly the federal legislation. So I'd like to maybe call up as I announce their name. And we have four panelists. Uh, first is Andy Bagnell. And Andy is President and Chief Executive Officer at St. Nicholas Hospital. Second, uh, Dave Gravener. And Dave is Chief Administrative Officer at Aurora Sheboygan Memorial Medical Center. Next, uh, Julie Hirschlepp. And Julie is... Um, Resources Director at Johnsonville Sausage. And last but not least is Dr. Asha Rai of Prevea. And Dr. Rai is President and Chief Executive Officer of Prevea Health, which is an Ashwaubenon based organization with more than 200 healthcare providers. Um, and Prevea is also a sponsor of our First Friday Forums in 012, as they were in 011. And we're changing things up a little bit uh, this year. Um, we're going to have a sort of a formal uh, question, questioner to answer e uh, format. And performing the Anderson Cooper duties for the questioning side of things is our own committee member, Charles Windsor. Well, welcome everybody. We have a very big topic when we talk about health care in the United States. And uh, rather complicated, we have a handout at your table the flowchart about the uh, the new health care regulation system that's going to be as modified by the health uh, care act there's extra copies if you don't have enough uh, for your table there's more on the table as you exit and also the chamber of commerce has an electronic version which you can call them or email them and ask for what's nice about that is you can magnify it on your computer <laughs> and read the citations about what section of the act is calling for the new or altered um, department. So we're not getting into this. <laughs> That's more than we want to handle. What we're mainly concerned about as employers in Sheboygan County is are our people, our employees, going to still have access, high quality, quick access to health care? What's it going to cost? And how can our uh, panelists help us make wise decisions as business leaders? So as you think of your questions, write them down. Please try to keep it to that and not the political side, which is way beyond our scope today. Thank you, panelists, for agreeing to join us. I appreciate that. And for our opening question, I'd like to direct it toward the hospital administrators. And that would be, <clears throat> what are St. Nicholas Hospital and Aurora Memorial Sheboygan Hospitals doing respectively to prepare for the health care legislation? It's an open-ended question, but please response is relatively short. I know you could go on for a good half hour each. We talked about that earlier. Thank you. Um, this is a very complicated topic. Um, there will be a quiz on the handout afterwards. So. <laughs> our, our TV folks are, if you can stand when you talk, then they can go to sleep. Okay. There are several things on the uh, reform proposed reform bill um, that are still in question, actually many of them still in question. For just to tee up the conversation, I thought it would be important to 
uh, at least give you an idea of why why healthcare reform and what was the intention of even drawing the attention to the healthcare reform bill. Um, Within the bill, um, there's over 2,000 pages of legislation, proposed le legislation, that still is yet to be um, So with this today, there's still a lot of unknowns, so I would throw a caveat into that. But there are several just highlights um, in terms of what, um, what the legislation, what the intent was, or at least what was the proposed intent. Um, one was increasing insur uninsured population in the United States. So that was one area that um, needed to be addressed or um, proposed to be addressed. Insurance market risk selection, inefficient financing and delivery systems, and uneven burdens and accountability. Um, so the payment system was, is flawed in terms of how healthcare providers um, and hospitals are paid today. Um, and, and it's not really a level of playing field in all cases, um, depending on quality and cost and the region of the country that you live. So with that background, what, what is St. Nicholas Hospital doing to prepare for health care reform? Um, a lot, actually. And I would say more than just preparing for health care reform as it is as much as doing what's really necessary to provide high quality, low cost health care for our community. Really a high value. Um, so with that, what are the specific things? Um, and, and with this proposed legislation and with that high value is really moving from a system that's been driven on vo volume based, so the more volume of patients that you see each and every day to more of a value based, value based purchasing. So number one, we're in the process of adoption, adopting an electronic medical record at St. Nicholas Hospital. Um, that uh, process um, is going to be complete at the, on the hospital side January 29th. Um, with that, um, there's a lot of improved quality, cost, efficiencies that come with that. Um, reduction of errors, patient safety. Um, with that, we have um, our physician partners are also going live with Epic at the same time um, and or even prior. So our uh, entire system of care here in Sheboygan will be on Epic, an electronic platform. Partnerships and alignments. You know, development of partnerships and relationships with employers um, and providers within our region and our community, but also more importantly, the partnership and relationship we have to our healthcare system in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, we are part of Hospital Sisters Health System, which is a network of hospitals uh, across Illinois and Wisconsin, for those of you that aren't aware of that. With that, um, it is really important to know that with with any healthcare system, you have a common purpose, a common vision, common mission, common values, but more importantly, you have a common strategy in how you're going to um, approach the care of your patients, um, benchmarking across the system, sharing best practices across the system, how do we spread costs across the system. Um, as many of you may be aware, we're part of the Eastern Wisconsin Division. Um, we have three hospitals um, across this division within um, HSHS, uh, St. Mary's Green Bay, St. Vincent Green Bay, and St. Nicholas Hospital here in Sheboygan. And with that, we're, we've been sharing a lot of resources amongst those to increase efficiency and decrease cost across that continuum. More importantly, um, partnerships through clinical integration with our providers at St. Nicholas Hospital. But more than just the partnership and relationship, but partnership in improving quality, um, efficiency, and a greater coordinated level of care for our patients across the continuum of care. Our relationships with re regional providers. Um, there's new relationships developing across this region um, and uh, within Wisconsin, as uh, many of you probably already seen. So a collaborative care model with, with some of the providers in the area. And then finally, uh, within relationships, partnerships with the community and the employers to help raise the health care so costs and try to figure out how do we work together to better um, reduce costs but also provide high quality care for your employees? Now, what specifically are you doing to pull out the cost at St. Nicholas Hospital? That's what I'm sure a lot of you are already asking. Um, because that was also part of the health care reform bill was um, it was found that um, there was a lot of waste um, in the system and inefficiencies from an operational perspective that could be improved in the health care delivery system. We 
have implemented the lean technology or lean um, tools at St. Nicholas Hospital in the last couple years. Many of you are probably aware of lean in many of your businesses, but I will be honest with you, healthcare um, was a late adopter to those kinds of uh, tools and um, resources. We've been doing this now for a couple years, um, and the goal with that is not only drive out waste, but what we're finding is it's improving quality, it's improving patient experience, and it is um, reducing our cost of care. Thing, um, it, and I mentioned before, improvement in spreading cost across our, our system. Many hospitals across the country um, may have duplicative systems <laughs> in, their, in their process and or in their departments that they run in their everyday um, workplace. Um, for example, at St. Nicholas Hospital, we had some duplicative efforts being made at St. Nicholas as compared to our, our other partner hospitals, system hospitals in Green Bay. How can we more effectively lead the three hospitals in our region and spread those uh, costs across? Again, as I mentioned before, and then f improving safety, quality, and patient experience. Um, we are moving into, and actually we're already into, a more transparent environment in healthcare. There's quality information that's getting posted now on the internet um, that you can go online and actually see certain quality parameters. Um, there's patient satisfaction information now um, that's on um, online. You can go look at and compare different hospitals across the country and where ho our hospitals are um, at St. Nicholas and Aurora, respectively. And so that this transparency is really driving um, a rapid improvement um, and focus in these areas. Not to say that that wasn't the right thing to do already, um, but there's an extreme focus on that. I wouldn't even say extreme, appropriate focus. What are our goals at St. Nicholas Hospital? I think it's important with this change, um, what, what might be different um, and what are you trying to accomplish? Um, we want to be a highly reliable organization. Uh, we want to provide exceptional uh, safety, um, a great patient experience, and um, quality in our clinical uh, care model that's supported by advanced clinical integration and clinical information systems. We want to provide high value. We want to be in the top decile of performance across our country. That's what we're striving to be. Relationships and collaborations with providers and businesses. S provide spiritually holistic care that touches on all faith traditions. It's how we were founded on over 120 years ago. And with that, St. Nicholas Hospital has been in this community for over 120 years. We have a very strong commitment to continue that in providing that level of care, high quality care, high patient service, but also partner and have those conversations about what can we do together to reduce cost, what can we do together to improve quality and um, experience for the patients that, that we serve. We, um, we strive to improve that each and every day um, for the employers, um, your employees, and the community that we serve, and we continue to do that, and that is our goal. Thank you, Andy. Dave? Oh, and by the way, folks, as you're writing the questions, I think a most efficient way to get them to us is pass them from person to person down to this corner, and then we can have Dave go through them and uh, help organize them. I don't know that I've ever been in this room without a glass of wine. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'm going to take you know the solitude of the golf course out there. Um, I think I think as Andy kind of described, we've seen a lot of change in healthcare. Um, you know, I think that 30 percent, 35 percent of our patients are paid by the government. You know, with Medicare, so that's certainly a big change. But you know, I think we've certainly um, been focused on for businesses to be effective. You need to have um, employees that are healthy, you need to have employees that um, we're not spending your dollar um, as you're trying to be competitive elsewhere in the nation. And so I think both organizations, that's certainly been a focus is that we have a certain responsibility around managing health care costs going forward, even though maybe not some of our incentives today economically are always based on that. So, um, so you know, there's been a lot of and I think a lot of work over the last uh, several years. And I think as, you know, a new member in our community here, 
we have great health care in our community, uh, St. Nicholas and, and Aurora, in how we compare elsewhere. Um, so I think we're starting from a good place uh, where that may not be true other parts of the nation. Um, I think the, you know, the, the changes that, that we've been you know, focused really are around how are we integrating services and, and some of the uh, pieces that Andy talked about is what kind of have we made. And so you know, how do we better align our physicians and our clinics with the hospital as core to who we are? Um, we've gone through really an assessment about what are the core services that we believe we're good at um, and also made some decisions about what things we're not good at and making sure that we're, we're kind of moving to a long-term strategy. So we can't be everything to everybody, uh, but we want to be good in the things that we're focused on. Um, the, um, we've, we've done a lot of the operational improvement already, although we have a lot to do. So like Andy talked about, we brought in lean several years ago. Um, we benchmarked nationally to how our operations are, uh, what our costs of care are, and have plans and, and execution associated with those plans like any business that's, that's going through change. Um, so we're positioned quite well um, around that moving forward. Um, we also have focused on our programs and what things do we do to support the community and what things do we think are core to our function with the community and then how over time do we make sure we're not duplicating services uh, that aren't sustainable in the community. And so, you know, I think that's something we're always asking our question around is how do we do that um, to make sure we're providing the best care. And then, you know, as, as Andy talked about is the IS system. You know, banking went through this, you know, never number of years ago, but tying our revenue side and our, and our expense side and the clinical component into one system, again, we're making investment as well. Um, for, um, for that moving forward. So that's going to be a critical part of our infrastructure. Um, the other area that, um, you know, is a challenge, and it's a little easier with Andy and I being new, both new to our role, is where do we compete and where do we partner? And so, you know, I think our organization certainly sees a uh, need to, to meet the needs of the community. We want to provide that service locally. Um, and but there may be places that make sense for us the, to not compete around to do things together, and that's not just St. Nicholas and Aurora. Um, it may be other uh, other uh, um, nonprofits or other services in the community. That's a different approach, I think, than historically Aurora has taken. So that's a new kind of new direction for us that we think is really critical as we move forward in preparing for healthcare um, reform. I think, you know, as Andy talked about, uh, our big change um, from the delivery side in healthcare is, is um, Medicare is going to be changing over the next several years in that there's 9% of how they pay us today that's going to be at risk based on our performance. So how we're measured around our mortality in our hospital, how we're measured around how well we're working with nursing homes around avoiding um, readmissions. All of those things today we're getting paid for without any kind of ownership around those issues. Where in the future, uh, there's about 10 different areas that they're gonna be measuring our performance on that um, will you know, reduce overall cost and improve uh, quality of care. And so we've been very focused on how are we working with our clinic partners and our physicians in, in uh, development of programs to, to do that. And then I think the, you know, the, the bad debt and, and charity care and the component of, of, you know, we're here to serve patients. And so how um, are we preparing for some of those changes? We've, because of our economics in our, in our community, we've had to make some changes in how we're dealing with bad debt. We're, 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 we're about, we're, we've doubled our bad debt at Aurora Sheborga Memorial. I imagine it's similar at St. Nicholas. And so how do we make sure we provide services that allow access for patients, not the emergency room, but you know care. And so you know our partnership with with um, you know around the community clinic, all those kind of things are ways in which we're trying to really support the community given some of the economics that are outside of our control. And then I think you know lastly is really the focus around how do we move from illness to wellness. 
in when we're paid as we're we're paid on wellness um, or we're paid on illness. And but you know I think to, for us to manage costs going forward, it's really about, about how are we involved in education. You know we've increased our community education budget by 30 percent this last year, and that's going to continue because it's going to be an important part of what we have to do to support um, you know health care in our community. Um, so. And then I think the you know the other side to that is we have a you know within Aurora we have thirty thousand employees ourselves and so we see the cost of healthcare and the impact so we're using our own employee base to help design and develop services that are going to reduce overall costs and we hope then that learning and experience can be translated in how we work with uh, employers as well. We have a nice question here uh, that follows up on one of your points, and that is, um, uh, is it rather duplicative to have two hospitals in Sheboygan, and it could cost be reduced if you kind of combine actually physical facilities as well as uh, just sharing some of the some of the services that are offered? I, um, I think. It's a really good question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the early bird rotary, and they ask really good questions, so I know that had to come from the early bird rotary. <laughs> I said I'd work that in there today. Um, the, um, now I forgot the question. <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, and, and I'm, Andy and I've talked about this, so he, he can say, say what his feeling, you know, it's, Yang, you know, I go out and meet a lot of business leaders. Probably met with you in the community here, and they like that there's competition because it keeps us honest, right? It makes sure that we're providing service and our our prices, our costs are down. I think the the other side to that is that there's capital. We're a very capital intensive, you know, technology driven service, and so there may be times that so. That, that that doesn't make sense for us to be in competition. And I think that's part of what you can expect from, you know, at least from me, is that um, we need to look at those issues and make sure that we're making the right decisions because we see our role is, is serving the community. The thing I'd like to share is that <clears throat> Dave and I actually play golf together, so we get along. <laughs> um, no, and I would agree. I mean, I think competition is a good thing. It, it does raise the bar of the care that's provided locally in the community. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be seen as um, raising cost it, as much as raising quality of the service that we're providing. It forces us both to be honest about that and say, how can we be better? Um, and we have regular dialogue about that. But I can tell you that it sure forces St. Nicholas Hospital to provide a higher quality service when I've got Dave across town trying to do the same thing. So what kind of product are we able to deliver to the community when we do that? So I, I think, you know, I agree with everything Dave said and, and just add those comments too, other than the golf. <laughs> Now we'll move on to uh, Julie. Um, she's got a unique perspective. Because Johnsonville is self-insured, she's really, really in the middle of it all. So I'd like to ask her, um, uh, excuse me. Well, Julie, you're prepared. Yeah, I'm prepared. Do you want to know what Johnsonville is doing to be compliant with health care reform? Yes, the extra challenges you've been facing. <laughs> How long do I have? <laughs> well, maybe five or ten. Okay, or ten no, minutes. I'm just teasing. Um, first of all, we've really focused on what is our strategy going to be around this beast called health care reform? Are we going to remain a grandfather plan? Are we going to be non grandfathered? And we've really come to the decision that we want to be grandfathered. And what that means for us is that um, until 2014, we're protected from the payment of clinical trials. Okay? And can I stand on a soapbox for a while? Or? Sure. <laughs> um, we, we don't believe that um, clinical trials should be paid for by employers or insurance companies. We believe that they're the R&D expenses of those doing the clinical trials. So we want to protect Johnsonville's assets as long as we can because we're that our costs are not fixed. And by doing that, we think one way to do that is to prevent the, 
the payment of clinical trials. Um, we have had to change our plan design for 2011. Um, the two major changes that we made um, were to adjust our eligibility requirements for adult children. So now an adult child, whether they're married or not, can be a participant in our plan as long as they don't have other health insurance. So that's been a change for us. We've also had to remove our lifetime limit. Um, it was, I believe, $5 million. Um, and that is really a scary proposition for us. Um, you may know we, we purchase reinsurance or stop loss insurance to protect Johnsonville against very large claims. And um, my fear is that in the future, if we're to um, insure someone that has a very high cost disease like hemophilia, they can incur costs of $2 million every year. And I'm afraid that our stop loss carriers will laser those individuals and refuse to pay you know, what they would normally pay in, in other situations. And so it really exposes Johnsonville to increased costs. Um, and so it, it, it's really scary. The third thing that we've done to prepare is to communicate with our members. We have been talking with our members and we have been very frank and honest about how health care reform will affect Johnsonville, how it will affect them. Um, we, we're honest with them that it is increasing our costs. It has increased our costs already. And because we share costs with our members, it has increased their costs. And we tell them to vote. We, we explain how health care reform impacts them. And, you know, people hear about health care reform on the TV, through the news, maybe through their neighbors, but they really don't understand the details of it. But once we tell them, we've had members thank us and said, I really had no idea of how this impacts us. And so we encourage them to vote whether they support health care reform or not. And we've been communicating this very hard. We started um, October of 2010. Um, the president traveled with me um, the month of October and attended all of our plant meetings so that we could explain this to our members. Um, I hit it really hard again this year to explain health care reform. And next October, before the election, we'll both be going out to all the locations and talking about it in detail. So people are aware of how it's going to impact them. Okay. How's that? Thank you, Julie. <laughs> now we have Dr. Rye on the panel. He's not only the CEO of uh, Prevea, but he's also a practicing internal medicine physician. So that's the reason he's on the panel is his perspective as a provider. And the first question I'd like to ask him is, um, Tort reform is something that physicians have championed for in this legislation, but did not get. Can it bring the impact of liability concerns on our costs to cover care? You know, I think it's uh, it, it's a significant aspect uh, of where our charges go and how we practice medicine. Um, I don't think it's exclusive to medicine only. I, I think tort reform is probably very important to businesses in this room. Uh, liability reform would be. What it specifically does uh, without being addressed in this health care uh, legislation is it it's very hard now to truly put a price tag on what health care reform is going to cost. Um, you've now increased your base of who you're going to cover. Um, there's no limitations on what is covered. And there's no protection for the provider uh, in, in case of medical error. And we're not talking about protections. People should not practice medicine if they're bad physicians or bad providers. We're talking about economic protections not only for the providers but for you. You can think of the types of behaviors that are driven to us in training without any type of protection. Every single back pain getting an MRI, uh, Julie being self you can probably see there's certain providers that practice, uh, well, we're in mixed company, I won't talk about what we call it, but how we cover parts of our body when we practice medicine. Um, it really is about covering our, our, our tail on this. And is it appropriate? No. Does every headache need a CT scan? No. But it's that one CT scan you didn't do that could result in liability that creates 10 more CT scans than needed. And without any type of tort reform, you already know what the lack of liability insurance or liability protections in the country already cost us in healthcare, and it's to the hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's, that's been researched. But unfortunately, now with the legislation, you have now broadened that base of people who have access. So you've exponentially actually increased the expenses, and that wasn't really put into the calculation. So that's, that's a fear as a physician, as an employer, 
uh, going forward. I have a follow-up question on that. With the sure. increased access, is, uh, we've heard that there's a physician shortage in the country mm -hmm. now. Can you tell us how the number of physicians graduating from medical school is determined? Is that is because there's a sh perceived shortage, does that mean more people are allowed to go to medical school and graduate and it helps it fulfill that void? All right, I'll give you a med school 101 here. We could open up 200 medical schools tomorrow in the country, have 300 students per, and we have not trained one new doctor in the United States. It's not medical schools that determine how many physicians we have in our labor force. It's the postgraduate training after medical school. The, those four years prepare us to go out and pick our specialty. So it's the residency training spots. And residency training is actually mainly funded through CMS and Medicare, uh, basically through a, a government body uh, around grad, graduate medical education. That government body in 1996 capped the number of residency spots that the government could afford, and we have not trained really any significant more physicians per year since 96. Residency programs have been allowed to trade spots uh, within their own uh, areas, so you can take two internists here and we'll take those two spots from you, but the total N or the total number of physicians being trained hasn't increased. So what has happened is, as medical schools are created or, or started, you have more American medical grads filling those residency spots. So it does mean that you'll have more American-trained physicians practicing in the United States if you open up more medical schools, but you won't have any more physicians. Right now, we have a primary care and specialty care shortage. We're predicted, as you all know, we're now hitting the baby boomer age. We're, um, those that are baby boomers are accessing health care at a much higher rate than they were, say, five years ago. If you look at the shortages, and there's a ton of surveys out there, you can go from 10 to 50 to 100,000 100, physician shortages going forward. Now, once again, go back to the tort reform question, and you've now exponentially increased the number of people who have access to primary care through insurance, which is a good thing. But overall, the legislation did not increase the number of physicians able to provide care. We also have other providers, uh, such as nurse practitioners, physician assistants, who are extremely valuable to all of our health systems. Uh, but we've not really funded the creation of more of those spots either. So at the end of the day, you have a health care bill that provides access to millions more but still, you already have a strained resource, which is a provider resource, and now it will become even more strained going forward. Thank you. I have one more follow-up question for you, too, Doctor. <laughs> and it's, uh, I thought I was batting cleanup. I saw that big sack there. All right. <laughs> well, it has to do with liability. And um, there's these ethics committees or ethics panels. They're going to be making decisions, I understand, about the level of care that's provided. Is that true? And you know, so, does their decision impact your liability? If they say you cannot perform a procedure, does that absolve you of liability that you did not perform the procedure, which could have increased somebody's lifespan? That one's going to get, I'm going to try not to get political on this one. Try my best not yeah. to get political on this one, because there are advantages to review boards. Uh, making sure that the practice of medicine is governed in some way to make sure appropriate care is being delivered downstream. But individual review boards that are mandating or not mandating how care is provided without actually being at the bedside is a frustration for a physician. Um, we have those today, in all honesty. They're called the care managers that work for United Healthcare and Humana and Anthem. We have that today, and we are frustrated by that today. I mean, I very commonly will ask the person on the other end of the phone where they went to med school and when they examined my patient. So it's a very difficult subject going forward if you're going to do this on a more global perspective without an agreement on the provider side of what should and shouldn't be put forward there. You know, I would agree that clinical trials shouldn't be paid for by employers, as Julie pointed out. They need people make a lot of money off of those clinical trials when they actually become a product. That shouldn't be funded by all of you as employers. But at the same time, when there are therapies that we know that do work, it should be the physician making that decision, not, the, uh, not a board, not somebody who's not at the bedside. Thank you. <coughs> we have another audience uh, submitted question for the hospital administrators. Are you currently forming an ACO 
and I don't know what that is, guys. So uh, maybe you can help me spell. And uh, if so, how far along are you, and what uh, providers are included? Uh, pardon me? We can take that one together. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can take that. Um, ACO stands for uh, Accountable Care Organizations, and <clears throat> this is a difficult uh, topic um, because the proposed legislation is, is complicated right now related to ACOs. Um, the proposed le legislation, actually, um, the providers that are currently signed up to participate, how many in the country now? Is it six? No. Uh, I think the uh, pilot, there's over I don't remember the exact number. It's a pilot program. There's 50 that are signed up right now across all the providers in the country. Um, again, it's one of these areas of integration that you heard me talk about earlier with our providers. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a detailed integration of how we work together and collaborate to produce how high quality. And there's got to be accountability to that quality um, through um, really physician-led. Um, and so, as a hospital administrator, um, my role is to facilitate that and um, put that stuff together, but it's the physicians that are really working on improving quality together um, for the patients um, through accountable care organizations. And with that, I know there's a lot of <clears throat> topic or conversations about, well, and I've had a number of you actually approach me about this um, with skilled nursing facilities. Well, how, how about we join an accountable care organization together? And I look at them and I say, well, how is that going to work? Not to say that I, we can't make that work, and I think that there's conversations happening right now across those providers to say, how can we all work together across a continuum to improve quality? That's kind of a level of clinical integration, but not necessarily on a formal basis. So, for example, I've had several sniffs come up to me and say, well, how about we enter into a contract to, to do this kind of thing? It hasn't been defined yet. Um, it's a pilot program at this point. Um, we have a relationship with, with Purveya Health. We also have a relationship with a lot of other physicians at St. Nicholas Hospital uh, to improve quality. Just to give you the physician perspective and actually my own personal perspective, uh, accountable care organization is a, a concept, in all honesty, that's being piloted by Medicare. Uh, so it's strictly currently when you hear about it out and about, the term gets tossed around between private insurance and, and government insurance uh, a lot. Right now, ACO as a term is in the legislation. We waited about a year after the legislation was passed to see how that accountable care organization would be regulated. As you all know, and if you haven't spent any time in Washington, I actually don't recommend it, uh, but I have a lot of time on the Hill, unfortunately, and you have 2,200 pages of legislation or something around there with the, uh, the, accountable, uh, with the uh, Federal uh, Act, you'll likely get tens of thousands of pages of regulation now. And the regulatory body in charge of accountable care organizations is CMS, uh, the Center for Medicaid and uh, Medicare uh, Studies, and obviously you've probably read the political news where their leader is now been replaced. So it's somewhat of a moving target for those of us who are trying to figure out what to do. Do you want to participate in it or not? But really, if you look at the fundamentals of the pilot, it's about physicians and hospitals and other care practitioners, whether it's home health, hospice, or uh, SNFs, which is a, a nursing facility, uh, short-term nursing facility, partnering together, getting maybe paid one time, say for hip surgery, and dividing that among themselves and being accountable. So essentially bundling a payment, and being accountable for a population or a person. That concept isn't very new. It's just new to the government. And we participate in accountable care organization like pilots all the time with our private pay uh, insur insurers. Humana, Anthem, United, all the payers have some sort of version of a contract that's similar to what the government's trying to accomplish. Unfortunately, the government's not looking at what private pay has done and extrapolating that. They want to see what happens uh, at the government level. I think that hopefully answered the ACO question, but Dave, if you've got something more on what Aurora's working on as well. Um. You know, I think the, the concepts of an ACO are 
instead of being paid, you know, for an MRI, for your hip surgery, for your, you know, nursing home care that, that in essence, you're paid for that whole episode of care to get you healthy. And that the organization then is at risk in how we manage that process. And so, you know, I think that's, that's as we talked about, you know, what are the things we're doing to get ready, it requires us to measure differently, order differently, work with our providers to, to have a more consistent approach with that. And so, you know, I think we're focused very hard on, on the things that we think can improve care that maybe the government's measuring that will ready us for uh, ACO. But we're waiting kind of for those things to come out. You know, what's the definition? How, how will each employer or how are each um, insurance cover or um, the government in essence define that, H, that, that ACO? Um, so, and I think that's, you know, yet to be defined. Um, I think we're, we've, are gonna be participating in several pilots as part of that so we can learn and prepare. Um, but, you know, I think the concepts that we talked about earlier around how do we guarantee our care that if you leave the hospital, you're not gonna come back in 30 days or that, you know, we don't, we don't create infection and additional cost. I think that those are the ways in which we're getting ready for, for the kind of the new, new payment structure. I have another question for Julie. And uh, one, one factor with the uh, Affordable Care Act is that uh, there's a hypothesis that a lot of employers may drop the coverage that they're offering to their employees and then pay them more to enable them to go and buy their individual policies either in the open market or in one of the exchanges. So the question for Julie is, even if you don't provide health care, health insurance in the future, what role do you feel as an employer Johnsonville will have on the role of uh, on the health of their employees? Um, I think we all know that a healthy member or healthy employee is a more productive um, member or employee. Um, so I think that employers Johnsonville will still have a role in trying to improve our, all of our members' health. And currently we have a very robust wellness program um, we have an on-site fitness center. We have Weight Watchers at work. Um, we have a health and wellness center with Aurora Healthcare in Plymouth, where members and their and their families can have access to free healthcare. Um, but in the future, um, what I found is with our our wellness program is that a lot of our spouses are incentivized through money. Okay, so um, for the last two years, we're in our third year um, with a very robust wellness program, and our members can save up to, up to $1,200 annual on their health insurance premiums. So we have a very large participation in our wellness programs, and without that carrot or stick, um, I'm not sure how much participation we'll have in the future. So even though we may continue to offer wellness programs, offer Weight Watchers at work, we have a fitness center downstairs, I'm not sure how much participation we'll have without that incentive and um, that health insurance incentive is working for us. So we might have to be more creative in the future about how we can continue that engagement. Thank you, Julie. Um, we have another audience uh, submitted question in, uh, <clears throat> this year the top 40 prescription drugs will become generic. Should the drug prices decrease in cost? And is that accurate, 40, the top 40? Are going to be coming generic, and I don't know who to address this one to. I don't know if somebody. Sure. All right. <laughs> I think I'm the only one on the stage who actually writes prescriptions. So, actually, they're all electronic right now. I don't think I've written one in a very long time. Well, that's good. Everybody can read the signature. Yeah. Then. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen my signature, he's right. Usually, the contracts get returned. Could he please sign in the circle? And my assistant says, "No, that's his signature." <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if it's quite 40, but I, I, there is a significant amount. It might be 40. I think the lay press has been on this, uh, but obviously some of the more popular ones, such as Lipitor and, and others for cholesterol are going generic. It's interesting, the cycle of how drugs are created. I think that's you know how a bill becomes a law, how a drug becomes a drug. Um, most of the research is actually funded by federal dollars, and I don't think people realize that. They think pharma actually pays for the research. Pharma actually pays for probably the last two phases of before a drug actually goes out to market. 
The majority is done by the National Institute of Health. NIH does a lot of research, turns over that research to pharma, uh, pharma being the pharma, pharmaceutical companies. They take it the next two steps. And essentially what they're trying to do is obviously recoup their costs before it becomes generic. What you have to understand when you look at healthcare cost around drugs, uh, everybody talks about how much cheaper medicine, or sorry, medicine is practiced in Europe or in Asia, England, the Netherlands is cheaper because we're paying for all the drug research for the whole world. Yes, we do trials in Europe, but the majority of the pharma companies are actually located here and it's all of our costs. So when you start to compare costs there, so should costs come down? Yes. Should other countries bear the responsibility of funding those first few stages? Most definitely. Are we going to get that? No. But if you look at where all the AIDS research and AIDS uh, medicines, for example, are happening, it, all the research and development is happening in America, but the majority of the usage is actually happening in the African subcontinent. So it's a tough situation for a country that has a responsibility for the world. So yes, it should come down. Yes, we should advocate and vote so they do come down. Uh, but it is a capitalistic market. And at the end of the day, I don't think regulation should actually create that. There should actually be a little less of government involvement and a little bit more on farmers' shoulders. And then they'll learn to spread that to other countries. But as long as we continue to fund through taxpayer dollars a significant part of that research, we'll never actually see the cost trend down because we're not letting the capital markets decide that. Thank you. Can I just add? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, and, and this is from a hospital administrator standpoint. I think four years ago um, in my past role, um, I budgeted for drugs at 11% at increase. That was four years ago. Uh, this last year, I think, I don't know what you budgeted, the change is about 3%. So um, there's, there's a big change, and I think it's helpful. I think the challenge we're having is getting basic drugs that are, that are really common drugs. And, it's, and a lot has to do with the kind of the incentives, both the government regulation that's happening with it, but also the incentives for drug companies to maintain um, those generic drugs. So, so I think it is, it's a growing issue, not necessarily from standpoint, but really from an access standpoint. And I would echo those comments. Um, just last December, and I'm sure Dave can speak to this as well, we're having issues getting common drugs um, in the hospital for certain things. Um, and uh, some of them are pretty common drugs that are required for our patients' uh, care every day. And you know, we were put in a position where we actually had to um, put different vials um, to conserve on drugs because it took on certain ones um, so that we could uh, provide care to our patients. Um, I mean, I'm talking very common um, uh, drugs uh, for patients that are going into surgery, uh, for pain, et cetera. So, um, you know, it, it's becoming a big issue. <coughs> not only cost, but access. Yeah. There's just not enough supply of you not being able to pay for them. Right. So, it's important to know that supply is actually regulated by pharma. So we saw supply decreases in our less expensive medications, which obviously could be replaced by much more expensive medications. We're probably not the right thing to do, but sometimes the only alternative. In oncology, we see this in pain. We definitely see this in antimicrobials, uh, antibiotics. Um, and so you've got an industry that does have a, maybe a little too much control on that, but once again, it's, that is business. And they're driving the supply, the supply side of the equation as much as they're uh, uh, determining what choices we have as well. So maybe going to generic is going to help that situation also. If we can get enough, more more a, enough of a market for a generic producing, you know, if pharma actually doesn't start getting into that business, and we get a, a section that actually starts getting more into generics, then we could see an improvement. Um, from our employer perspective, we can't wait until the drug goes generic. <laughs> and I'd like to see some reform around the cost of specialty drugs. Um, our our non-specialty drug costs are very flat, and we're just getting killed on our specialty drug costs. They're increasing by over 20% going into next year. Well, we're almost to our uh, stopping time of about 1.30, so we have one final question. We'll start with Andy again and just work down the panelist line. 
Um, what uh, should our employers take away from this discussion? We've all had a lot of uh, good Remember, we should tell our bosses when we get back to work. Yeah, I think I think number one, it's important that that you have two great healthcare institutions providing great care in Sheboygan County, and both institutions are very committed to continuing that well into the future. And I think you should also be very proud of the fact that um, you've got two very innovative um, healthcare systems here, um, thinking ahead in terms of how we prepare for healthcare reform and um, being open and flexible to changing that to meet our local community needs. I think the other piece that really wasn't hit on, um, and I know George and I think it's a very important takeaway, is look at your benefit structure. Um, take a look and see, you know, how can you prevent um, things from happening to reduce your costs. And I think the other piece is to um, not be afraid to partner uh, with us as a healthcare provider to help you uh, improve the health and well-being of your employees. Yeah, I would, I would kind of echo that. I think the benefit structure for the large employers, you know, is really critical because in creating an incentive that's aligned with good care, but also individual management, um, I think helps us, you know, do a better job in caring for patients. Um, I think, you know, the Andy had mentioned earlier the informed consumer, and we see this more and more. Um, it, it's helpful when the government and others put uh, some measures around what is what is good outcomes look like, because then it it helps us all focus on that. So an informed employee. Um, you know, providing op op options for them um, to improve their health, but also make decisions is important. And then I think the alignment, you know, as we talked a little bit about ACOs, we're all going to be looking at ways in which we can support the risk, you know, going forward. And so doing that in partnership, um, you know, between employers and healthcare providers um, is going to be important. Um, first, I would say that I think as employers in Sheboygan County, we're re really lucky to have um, the Purveyors of St. Nick's and, and the Aurora um, to help us as employers um, help our own members and employees become healthy. I think they all offer really great um, programs that we can take advantage of. Um, the second point is to really focus and concentrate on creating a strategy, your business strategy around health care reform. Um, if I look into my crystal ball, I honestly feel that employer-sponsored health care is going to cease to exist in future years because of the penalties and the incentives not to offer it. Um, so I would just encourage everyone to um, focus on their strategy for the future. You know, purely from a physician perspective, we, we were here to talk about a health care reform bill. Let's remember that, you know, from from a doc's perspective, 2,200 pages of legislation actually didn't make America healthier. It did increase access, but it didn't make us healthier. But at the same time, we shouldn't rely on the government to make us healthier. As employers, you have a very unique opportunity to engage your employees on creating a healthier workforce. Julie's done an incredible job. There's many of you in this room who have done an incredible job of providing on-site education, on-site facilities, um, to make your employees healthier. A healthy workforce is going to be a more productive workforce. The legislation in itself is going to probably create issues for you going forward on deciding whether to provide employer-based, uh, employer-sponsored health insurance or not. But at the same time, you should ignore the fact that we still need to be a healthier county. Um, I live in Brown County. My family's from uh, Sheboygan County. I commute back and forth uh, working. Um, I won't retire until we're known to be the healthiest area uh, in the country. Um, when I walk into a Packer game, uh, I used to walk in there uh, as a 28-year-old physician and smile because it was job security. <laughs> there is nothing more than job security when you walk through tailgating at Lambeau. <laughs> Grown up a little since then, and now I have to run a company and I have to pay health insurance for 1,350 people, and I realized if, as a health care provider, we don't take the pulpit that we've been granted to make our communities healthier and help all of you become healthier, uh, we haven't really done our job. So don't expect health care reform legislation to do it, but hopefully more interaction between employer and health care provider can make us all healthier. And uh, uh, I don't know if the panels will be around for personal yeah. questions.
I can. That'd be great. Shall I do so? Thanks. Thank you. Do so. Good job. Uh, do so. Yeah.